Wahyo, kesa si kiwe sta istnawa. Pas kwa winok. Utat mo winwa. The treaties of Saskatchewan have played and continue to play an important role in our province. It is important that we all remember what was intended by the treaties and how those treaty promises have been preserved. First Nations values, customs, beliefs, traditions, history and events are passed on through oral tradition. These oral traditions follow strict laws of respect. Information being shared cannot be altered or changed from its original form. This is how the story of treaty has been passed down to today's generation. How the leaders of the Cree, Sotal, Nakota and Dene nations concluded five treaties with the Government of Canada. At the time of treaty making, the leaders realized the buffalo were disappearing and their livelihood was threatened. <laughs> At the same time, more and more people were arriving in the area of land that is now known as Saskatchewan, and the Canadian government wanted to make sure there was land available. Treaties with First Nations were seen as a way to open up more land for settlement and stop pressure from the United States to push the American border north. First Nations realized they needed to adapt to the newcomer's way of life, so they agreed to enter into treaty negotiations with the British Crown. They were already familiar with treaty making with First Nation to First Nation treaties. They had also formed peace and friendship treaties with the British government long before the country of Canada was created. At the time of treaty making, as I was saying, in year, they told us that they, they put peace and in harmony in, that, in those treaties. To us, it means in Cree, it's 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 Wahkutun, it's 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 First Nations people believed that the pipe ceremony ensured trust and obligation among the people involved. When a person participates in a pipe ceremony, there is an obligation to fulfill agreements and conduct oneself in a respectful, trustworthy manner. To signify the agreement had been made, the government representatives used written documents stamped with a seal to signify the tradition of the Crown. This long-standing European tradition is still practiced in Canada and around the world. The agreements that were made with pipe and paper between 1874 and 1906 laid the foundation for Treaty First Nations people and other Canadians to peacefully coexist. The leaders of First Nations were keenly aware of the significant role the treaty would have on future generations of First Nations people. The words of the Crown's representatives also support the idea that the treaties were to be honored forever. Lieutenant Governor Alexander Morris played a key role in the original treaty negotiations in Fort Capel in 1874 and Fort Carleton and Fort Pitt in 1876. I am a Queen's Councillor. I am her governor of all these territories. 
and I am here to speak from her to you. What I trust and hope we will do is not for today or tomorrow only. What I will promise and what I believe and hope you will take is to last as long as that sun shines and yonder river flows. The Dominion government, acting on behalf of the British Crown, knew they were obligated by the Royal Proclamation of 1763 to enter into treaty negotiations with First Nations people. Initially, they arrived at the negotiations with the treaty already written up. The treaties on the prairies were modeled after earlier treaties that were negotiated in Eastern Canada. The government got control of all the land in Western Canada except for small reserves that were retained by First Nations. The government viewed these as land transactions with the Crown, gaining ownership over lands in exchange for treaty obligations such as hunting, fishing and trapping rights, education, health care and farming assistance. However, because of the negotiation process that has been recorded on paper and in oral history, we know that the treaties are more than quick land sales. Specifically, oral accounts emphasize that First Nations had a different understanding of the use and preservation of the land. That land was to be shared harmoniously, not owned. I think the thing that really stands out the most is the hopes and aspirations that were there at the time of treaty and something new was required and, and that you know, to help them acquire that livelihood that they've always enjoyed in this land. The animals were gone, the buffalo was gone, and a lot of the things that they, that they needed in order to survive, were, you know, were, were actually beginning to, beginning to uh, fade, and the need to, 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 to acquire new tools to survive, you know, were, were, were absolutely ne necessary. We came to the table 125 years ago with a lot of hope and anticipation to learn about these new ways, to learn about a new way of living. We came to the table, you know, with the intention of, of being partners. Treaties were, be, were between First Nations and the Crown, and the Crown uh, benefited greatly from those treaties, and here in Saskatchewan, of course, those treaties enabled the settlement of the Great Plains and enabled uh, grain farming to take place so that uh, the, uh, the non-Indian uh, people of Saskatchewan benefited enormously from these treaties. I felt ashamed when I was growing up in school and I felt uh, I was ashamed to be Indian, I was ashamed to be First Nations and uh, I wanted to be more white because I felt I'd be more accepted into society and growing up and coming to university, especially at Saskatchewan Indian Federal College, when I first took my first Indian Studies courses, I learned about the treaties. I realized then that how important um, my ancestors were at that negotiation, that there was terms and conditions there that needed to be taken care of by both parties and equally shared as a partnership. And that I thought, you know, my, my ancestors were really thinking, they were really smart people, they, they were visionist. They were thinking about us, those children, yet unborn. As an old man, I'm, all, I'm always worried about people not getting along with each other. And if we were to fully understand one another, if the non-Indian person was to fully understand us, us treaty Indians and our treaties, they wouldn't look at us as people that cannot earn their living. They would look at us differently. It is important that we all remember what was intended by the treaties and how those treaty promises have been preserved. We are all treaty Canadians. The treaties are a legacy for all of us.
indigenous people in our treaty relationship, we look at the treaties as being sacred, very sacred, and they're binding. Mm -hmm. And the government has not fulfilled uh, the treaty obligations, land questions, uh, revenue sharing. Uh, you know, we have rights to to education and health. You know, and and those those benefits would accrue from the land and resources that we shared with the government. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that uh, the federal government receives royalties, revenues, you know, generated from these resources, from forestry, mining, gas and oil, and, and fisheries, you know, billions of dollars. You know, I know they, they, have, they have the money, the wherewithal to meet its treaty obligations, mm -hmm. but they don't. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that's really a problem. They, they've put us in, uh, in reservations in which we've uh, experienced, uh, uh, you know, uh, terrible living conditions, uh, social chaos, and, uh, and, you know, we have family breakdown. And on top of that, you know, people that have gone to residence school being denied of our culture, being void of who we are, our identity, our language, our culture, you know. And that's something that uh, we're trying to try to, uh, I guess, instill in our, our young people. And some we do have uh, very strong elders and and people who speak their language. I speak my language, but our younger people begin to lose lose that. And uh, so we're, I think, in a rebuilding. Mm -hmm stage for, for, our, for our communities. And the government needs to recognize that. And that's why I say the government apologized. Uh, and the example that I gave was uh, about the man, you know, raping a woman and you know, the, the obligation extends mm -hmm. much beyond because of the consequences, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, so the government in its apology did not say this is what will happen, you know, the program how we might be healed, you know. I feel that the justice system has failed my daughter's life. If they would have done that right away, stop sentencing him, it would have done that to her. The community leaders knew. I did nothing. There's still a lot of questions that are in our minds and may never be answered, unfortunately. tribes starved to death. There was hunger, there was famine, and a couple of young warriors were sent out to look for food. They saw off to the distance a figure uh, moving towards them, a very uh, a beautiful woman dressed in white walking towards them. And she was a little girl that I know that she was always happy and always trying to do something for somebody, like for her grandma and stuff like that. And that's how she was. We were really, really close. Eh? Like there was a lot of things we did together. And, and after she bought her car, there was things that was going wrong with her car. But she wanted to do the work. And I was just a person just to talk her through it, like change a starter, an alternator, change oil. And these are things she wanted to do, and she'd come to me and I'd tell her, okay, well, put on my cover, you know what to do, my girl. The 
it's a ceremonial function and uh, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the innocence and the spirituality and, and the, the spirituality that the family holds, I guess, you know, are, are looked upon as factors when, when the young, young women are chosen, young girls are chosen to do that function. She brought in that sacred, that sacred pipe into our ceremony and she was dressed so beautiful. She had her long hair and her white dress and her white shawl and her moccasins that she danced in. Last time I seen her what was at this table, the night she left. We were just finished having supper. We sat here with our kids and then a car honked and we were just finishing supper and oh my ride is here he says and I told her what ride I told her he says uh we're gonna go out for the night he said so the young guy came in a little redman boy Tommy was his name and uh, I told her you're not taking your car out my girl and he said nope we'll leave the keys here what was the last thing you ever said to her? <sighs> that morning. I'll see her after work. As she came closer to the warriors, one of them uh, had bad thoughts. Thoughts of, of taking her for himself. She called out to the one with the bad thoughts and said, uh, I know what it is that you want. She said, come. She beckoned to him and, and the one with the bad thoughts went. This mysterious fog came down and uh, engulfed them. And when that fog lifted, that man with the bad thoughts lay um, just bones on the ground. All you National Enquirer mother I heard uh, somebody was really walking down outside and I said to my husband, you better check, there's somebody there. And just as we were walking from out of the kitchen to the porch, the shot came through the kitchen window. He, he didn't have a very long criminal record and while they were serious convictions, uh, lots of people have that kind of record in the province, lots of people, and they're not eligible for dangerous offender status. As much as an ordinary person looking at it may think they should be, they're not. Do you ever feel totally safe now? No. What kind of, how does that affect how you live? It's a joke to me that sitting a healing thing, sentence is a punch of crap if you ask me. I feel that the justice system has failed my daughter's life 
in not designating Albert Bellegarde as a dangerous offender. RCMP searchers and volunteers are looking for missing right. teenager Amber Redman. Dozens of friends and family still search the area. They've circulated posters just like this one across Saskatchewan at all of the First Nations and across Canada. Redman was last seen talking to someone in an old grey sedan outside Trapper's Bar in Fort Capel. After that, police are not sure where Amber went, but are following every clue they receive. Every second of the day, there was thoughts racing through my mind. You know, is she being fouled? Is she being held against her will? Is she being raped? Is she being beaten? But yeah, the worst is, is not knowing where she was. <laughs> 